and those who are talking about financialization or globalization and development now know that instead of being a puppet of America or Britain or China as a country, they are now puppets or forces. Now the South Africans suffering from a pain of trying to explain this simply call it state capture. The Kenyans suffering from trying to explain this simply call it grand corruption. Right? <laughs> you know, this is not a failure of morality. It is a projection of power which is diffuse. The masses of African young people cannot be content simply in their ability to insult their governments and insult everybody else around. They need to learn from the generation of Nkrumah and others. So what does this generation require is to do things that take us beyond simply articulately describing the nature of oppression. The belief in the superiority of other races other than Afro-descendants or persons of our has continued. So it's a, it's a marked continuity. As we grapple with the intergenerational question in Pan-Africanism, that it is an ideology dominated by old people, the class question dominated by middle class, and other questions that we can grapple with, let's keep in mind there are certain things that have been constant in the struggles for Pan-Africanism. We then get to 1945, and it's important for me to say this, 1945 was a moment of contradiction. 1945 was a competition between the Afro-Caribbeans, the Afro-Americans, and then in order to deal with some of those tensions, we invited the Africans <laughs> to try and... So that is why the invitation to the Africans was based on who invited them. Nkrumah, rapidly going left, socialist. Kamuzubanda, there was no person as colonial in orientation as Kamuz. He believed he was a European, right? Uh, Jomo Kenyatta, who I like to joke, was an unemployed Kenyan man living with his white girlfriend in London. <laughs> so we like to celebrate 1945. 1945 was a follow-up. Remember, Gavi had already formed his international association. It had a bill of rights for African people. It had demands relating to ownership of property, to sovereignty. It had demands relating to education and socioeconomic rights. It had all sorts of demands. So 1945 was a beauty contest and also a platform of compromise. Everybody was pushing their monkey. That's why you end up with a, a conclusion in 1945 that doesn't have the radicalism that others wanted from 1945. Now, what you are often not told is we had these Africans, what did they say to the conference? Did they even address the conference? <laughs> I, I don't know if I'm making sense, because we like to refer to this. I personally say 1945 recognized the need for African liberation that had always been part of the narrative of Africanist spaces from the Abyssinia, uh, Ethiopianism, and so on and so forth. So when we get to that, why was African liberation important? Global affairs were now ordered post-1918, the Treaty of Versailles, by countries or states dealing with each other. The role of individuals or monarchs in the ordering of global power and global affairs had diminished significantly. In 1945, Africa had been balkanized, right? And so the conversation was not about Africa owned by Africans. It was about Africa, which was now a footnote of various imperial interests. So the pan-Africanism of post-1945, of necessity, had to be anti-imperial, anti-colonial. You couldn't have a pan-Africanism arising out of a moment where we're colonially dominated and occupied that is not anti-imperial and anti-colonial. But there was a component to that Pan-Africanism that we all miss. It was the first Pan-Africanism informed. It's about the same time that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights had come up. So the language about rights emerges in the post-1945 discourse. That is why the appeal of most liberation movements was one man, one vote. 
I'm just saying it the way they said it. I know later on we try to say one person, but they said one man, one vote. And you wonder, when did Africans move from liberation to one man, one vote? Now, when you are moving towards the sixth pack, which happened in 1974 in Dar es Salaam, something had happened too. The project of one man, one vote had failed splendidly. A coup had occurred in Ghana removing Nkrumah. The attempt of, at building African socialism was being sabotaged by Cold War forces. And there had been a slight lull in the liberation. Mandela had been arrested in South Africa. And the notion that South Africa and Lesotho and Kowe were going to become the new lightning roads of Pan-Africanism from the South had been decapitated with the Robben Islanding of those comrades. West Africa through Sierra Leone and Liberia, which had been potential sources of African liberation and the lead countries in the emergence of Pan-Africanism were in a state of severe repression. The three-week party in Liberia had taken over, so they were being run literally by an oligarchy of a few people. So that is why you have emerging the notion of linking Pan-Africanism to armed struggle, right? So you will ask, here is a movement that started off with priests and preachers from the African Methodist Episcopal Church. How did it move to armed struggle? And this is, remember what I kept saying, that each historical epoch has allowed the continuities of struggle, but also certain disruptions in terms of, and these disruptions were not ideological in the main, save for the disjuncture between 1945 moving into the 60s, as I said, the coming in of the dominance of socialism, Marxism, in African liberation movements. They were, but in the main, these disruptions were tactical and strategic. Do you negotiate with the empire? Do you shoot your way to freedom? And this then spoke to an understanding of the aspiration of Pan-Africanism. The first Pan-Africanism wanted black equality, dignity, and respect. The Pan-Africanism informed by liberation struggle wanted black ownership, black takeover, black control. Now herein lies the contradiction because blackness became itself a hegemonic reference to everyone, but it did not necessarily include women as, co as equal owners. They were core participants in liberation but they were not necessarily because Pan-Africanism also, like any great idea, was subjected to local social-cultural interpretive modes. So there was the nativist movement that then began to say, we're yearning for an Africa uncontaminated by colonialism where our culture, that construction of culture was not based on culture as we know it, the progressive leaving manner of Africans who constantly created new value by engaging new opportunities and challenges. It was culture that gave privilege to a few. The resistance to that kind of Pan-Africanism, and you see the tension in the Pan-African movement from 1974 to 1994 when we get to the seventh pack. By the time we get to the seventh pack, two disconnects have happened. Remember I said from 1945, something comes into Pan-Africanism. It was called radical nationalism or nationalism. These are the nationalisms that were about owning your country, belonging. Which countries were we talking about? The ones defined in Berlin. <laughs> you understand? But when we go beyond this moment, there is a new yearning now. Because those of you who were not from chieftaincies or from royal families decided, no, this nuance on culture is privileging particular ethno-nationalist traits as opposed to a nationalism that's more inclusive and so on and so forth. We get to 1994. 1994, we gather in Kampala. There are people who are saying Pan-Africanism is an ideology of the masses. They are referring to Nkrumah. Pan-Africanism is an ideology of an African state, the influence of Gavi and Blyden on Gruma. Then you had the Nyererites, who were saying, no, 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 no. 
You see, because we have all these problems, let's use sub-regional blocks as building steps to Pan-Africanism. So by the time everyone woke up, Pan-Africanism had become a state-centric ideology. Before the liberation of African countries, it couldn't be state-centric because the state was dominated by the colonists or the colonialists. But after we took over the state, Pan-Africanism's appeal was because we control the state, the state can be a critical enabler of Pan-Africanism. A contradiction happens in 1994. We, because believed Museveni then was progressive and we had the Rwandan genocide and South Africa was getting liberated, Mandela was going to come up. Our belief in the African political elite was unmatched in history. 1994 is just three, four years after the conference in Benin the winds of change that you talk about that brought liberal democratization and so on and so forth. So Pan-Africanism in 1994 got infused with three tensions. Tension number one, the rise of a liberal construction of Pan-Africanism. Pan-Africanism as a postmodernist project, right? Where we're all competing to... And then you had the Campbells and others who were still left-wing. You had a Pan-Africanism that was left-leaning. Pan-Africanism has to keep its roots in a radical social distribution and redistribution project, ownership of the real economy. Then, of course, you had those who were in between who were just happy to be Africans, wear an African shirt, listen to Bob Marley, dance, and put up the sign, quote Fanon once in a while, or say something from, do you understand what I mean? So Pan-Africanism also became the home of the I call them the roving souls with no ideology, except that you know, we are just happy to be African. So when we meet today, Madam Chair, it is possible to call anything and everything Pan-Africanism, right? Anybody who wears a, an African shirt like me and then listens to Bob Marley or dons a dreadlock like some of you here becomes Pan-Africanist, right? So that is why the question we are asking today, Sekuture said, to take part in the African Revolution, it is not enough to write a revolutionary song. You must fashion the revolution with the people. James Baldwin says, the power of the white world is threatened whenever a black man refuses to accept the white man's definitions. Emperor Ali Selassie says, throughout history, it has been the inaction of those who could have acted, the indifference of those who should have known better, the silence of the voice of justice, when it mattered most, that has made it possible for evil to triumph. Chinwezu Ibekwe says, the central objective in decolonizing the African mind is to overthrow the authority which alien traditions exercise over the African. This demands the dismantling of white supremacist beliefs and the structures which uphold them in every area of African life. It must be stressed, however, that decolonization does not mean ignorance of foreign tradition. It simply means denial of their authority, and withdrawal of allegiance from them. William Tunga suggests that in the moment we live in, one, we should diversify who we borrow knowledge from. Right? And now, two, we should indigenize certain knowledge. And three, if we, that means if you borrow knowledge from somewhere, you know, don't just take it inorganically. What does that mean for modern Pan-Africanism? What has changed? We have the state, we've dominated the state. Having dominated the state, we also have all sorts of problems. So we have four primary pillars of change, and I want to land with that. I have thousands of things I could have said, but four primary. The first primary source of change, Madam Chair, is uh, the state in its local and global incarnation has changed in a fundamental sense. What we call the state, essentially, has, as Karl Marx projected, become simply the handmaid of certain dominant classes. And those who are talking about financialization or globalization and development now know that instead of being a puppet of America or Britain or China as a country, they are now puppets of forces. Now, the South Africans suffering from a pain of trying to explain this simply call it state capture. The Kenyans suffering from trying to explain this simply call it grand corruption. 
right? <laughs> you know, this is not a failure of morality. It is a projection of power which is diffuse, intended to keep privilege and certain cleavages of power intact. They realize that you can attack the state as a finite symbol of authority. You can defy it, vote against it in your numbers in the United Nations or wherever it is that you go in your multilateral. So now power is everywhere and nowhere. But in order to do this, they created an appetite amongst us for money and materialism. It is our brother Sate in writing the foreword to Fanon's book says, we have mistaken having and being, material possession as personality. So the entire African struggle for dignity, for belonging, is defined now in pejorative terms as voice and participation. Now, now I, I, I have no problem with voice. Even the birds outside have voice. I can't hear what they're saying. I don't care. Okay? <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? The radical nature of where we started was, let me tell you, even a person as racist as Hitler knew this. La Benstrom, a place in the sun. Right? The one thing that natives are spending our time doing, my sister and I were at a meeting, how do we make sure that the taxation is just? And I said, you have accepted ownership that's dominated by external foreign capital. Now you are looking in your own country, in your own real economy. You are looking for more modest accommodation. For those of you who are married, it's a story often told where I come from. You find a man as substantial as John, uh, being intimate with somebody who you think is your exclusive partner, and then you say to John, excuse me, tell me when you're done. <laughs> you know, If we are fundamentally true to young people, first challenge, a reconceptualization, voice is not enough to end your unemployment and miserable condition in life. Because everyone else, even in financialized globalization, are beginning to own space privatized, own the oceans privatized. We don't own nothing but voice. So the idea of the original Pan-Africanism was how to use voice to move from speaking to being, from being to owning, making ownership a humanized experience as opposed to an extractive experience. The masses of African young people cannot be content simply in their ability to insult their governments and insult everybody else around. They need to learn from the generation of Nkrumah and others. They spoke and spoke eloquently. That's why we recite their speeches. After they had spoken, France still controlled the economies of 15 Francophone countries. So what does this generation require? It is a radical Pan-Africanism that says, if our ancestors with their beautiful speeches were not able to dislodge that incarnation of power, the challenge for us is to do things that take us beyond simply articulately describing the nature of oppression. And that's the state and the multilateral system. That's the state and the corporate system. Have you ever wondered why the wealthiest black man is just a fraction of the rest, and why black woman, the wealthiest black woman, has to be a daughter of a thieving man? Have you ever wondered what is it with the economy that's keeping women in a place where even women's empowerment program is about microfinance and making soap and making, and I have no problem with that, comrades. I, I, I have no problem with soap and, 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 and honey and, 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 and so on and so on, and I'm saying that even if you were not a socialist, if you are going to be a neoliberal acolyte, be a good one. Right? So if you don't believe in socialism, smash the neoliberal system because it produces inequality, it produces xenophobia, it produces... If you don't believe in that and you want to be capitalist, you want to be as rich as Gates, at least let's see that you have a strategy for doing it. My own sense is we're poor capitalists 
were poor socialists. Right? <laughs> were even poor tribalists. <laughs> now, it seems to me that we have reduced then Pan-Africanism and we have begun to degrade it into narrow nationalism, ethno-nationalism, to village nationalism, and clan nationalism. So you go to Dandora, or you go to uh, Madare, you go to people, first they were fighting on whether we are Kikuyu and Lu and Ka. Now they are fighting on whether you're from section A or section B. But what is it? It's poor people fighting over poverty. So I wanted to suggest to you that after the state, the second thing that must become. So Pan-Africanism cannot be purely about Africa becoming like Europe, having high-rise buildings like Europe, roads like Europe, uh, service like Europe, and uh, uh, drug abuse like Europe, you know? And because we know what that Europe needed colonies, Belgium is beautiful because, unless if you are going to colonize, Maybe Obama's father showed you how you colonize as an African without uh, military might. Huh? Unless if you're going to colonize Europe, we have to defend Africa. I mean, can I repeat it? Unless you're going to colonize America, we have to defend Africa. What might that defense of Africa look like from an economic perspective? That is the challenge of this generation. For Nkrumah, it was going, we're going to have agriculture, an agro-based economy, then we're going to industrialize. Then after we've industrialized, we're going to move into high mechanization, ensuring that our people don't lose jobs. For us sitting in this room, we didn't get to the mechanization and the ambitions that they set in the 1963 conference. The economy is a second tier. The third tier, now Africa, has experienced three forms of growth, Comrade John. Number one, it's growth, we are told, this growth without jobs. 5.5%, 8.7%. Now, I'm not going to comment on that. I, I see com many comrades in the room that comment on that. The other growth is a growth of fanatical faith. Now, I am not mocking. I, I personally am a faith person. One of the things that happens when you are robbed of humanity and of meaning and of substance you begin to live in the metaphysical. So one of the things that's happened, if the number of churches in every corner, in fact, there's a place in Nairobi I used to call God Corner. You went there on Saturday or Sunday, every corner there's a, there's a, and I keep saying to myself, I have no problem with this entrepreneurship. But this is an entrepreneurship that does not enable the poor to become self-liberating. It does not enable our, enable our people to become productive. It does not enable our people even to become a class in themselves and a class for themselves against oppressors. Last week, I went to address a meeting of uh, bishops, and I said to them, I'm amazed. John and I, we struggle, John, to gather this group of conscious people in this room. <laughs> Every single one of these pastors, they have 35,000, 3,000, 4,000, 10,000. And I said, surely the only one reason why you should go to hell is after gathering 35,000 oppressed people, you did not tell them to be free. <laughs> I, I don't know if I'm making sense. That religion has grown without a liberation theology, without a liberation agenda, without... So don't bash religion. Ask religion. Ethiopianism was an answer to a religion that kept the native praying for heaven when they were oppressed and racially discriminated on earth. Rastafarianism was a religion that emerged out of a protest. The question I'm asking, Kenya, which claims to be 80 to 90%, if not 96% Muslim or Christian, how come these spaces of faith have not led, one, to integrity. The rate of corruption has grown with the rate of faith. Number two, they have led, not led to liberation and self-organization. Surely, if you meet every week together, you can organize to overthrow all the thieves. I, I don't know if I'm making sense. So I think the question of linking spirituality to liberation is a very important question. 
I think that we work from where we are, not from where we want to go. We are here, most of our people go to church, to the mosque. It is useful for us to begin to conscientize the mood. Reread the Islamic text and the Christian text and find liberation. Number four, technology. It, with technology, it seems that we can almost do anything. From what you described, Madame Che, you can almost do almost anything. But do you know that you can get a feel-good sense from feel-good non-achievement? Are, are you familiar with the dangers of feel-goodism? Is, is, I, 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 I used to indulge in this a lot. When my stomach started growing away from my body, I began feeling guilty because, you know, how you are a comrade, everybody has always known you, committed to the struggle. So each time I'm passing on the street, I would have a coin or something, and I, I just put it in the, when there's somebody who's asking, put it in there. Oh man, I would walk away feeling very accomplished, even if I was going to Java to go and spend a thousand rands, right? I don't know if any of you are like me. Maybe I'm the only one who's not truly Pan-Africanist like you, right? <laughs> so I keep saying to young people that when you're on Twitter or Facebook, Zuckerberg, the billionaire, becomes richer. So you can tweet on Facebook until you get arthritis. Zuckerberg is not, he ain't tweeting, to use an American term. He is coining it, baby. He's making money. So, so if your activism is going to promote consumerism, if your activism is going to make the son of an imperialist in America wealthier, and you're going to be just happy that uh, we told the government, then they changed this. Then they, we are trending. There is, I'm suggesting that your decadence is Western African leaders who held conferences in Addis and cheered each other. You know, there were no people around in the room. So they make great speeches and, and clap for each other. You know, <laughs> In the Shona language, they say it's like phoning yourself on your own number. Using the same number, you find the number engaged. <laughs> so I want to challenge people. There's nothing wrong with technology. How do we turn technology not into a driver of Pan-Africanist consumerism, even if it is protest consumerism, into a Pan-African? Remember, we still want to go to ownership, comrades, right? Yeah. Owning our real economy, owning the because if we don't own, we are merely what our ancestors were forced to become, consumers. So there is no Pan-Africanism that does not realize that technology could become one of the most potent tools of imperialism and cultural domination. And that you can become a celebrity of the domination of your own people using technology that you don't own or drive. Do you know what they did with Africans? Let me explain to you. They would get Africans who could speak English or French, dress them up in suits, take them to Oxford or to Harvard, they speak better than everybody else. They feel exceptional. They arrived and they flew them from corner to post and so on and so on. And they felt exceptional. They were trending. So I have come to just challenge what might Pan-Africanism mean when we have the tools such as technology? When do we get to own the tools? For us, we wanted to fight liberation. We had to go to the Russians to buy weapons. How is it that no single Africans thought of making a weapon? Think about it. They were African engineers. In fact, if you go to Nigeria and to Zimbabwe and elsewhere, and to Ghana, they'll tell you the first black PhD from MIT was from, so what? They didn't make a gun for liberation. I, I don't know if I'm making sense. So there is a decadence of literacy that's not linked to liberation. Education that is a validation of imperialism and white supremacy. We're not questioning any narratives. The biggest lie we tell people is that ideology has died. Ideology never died. Ask Trump and the alt-right. Ask uh, Marie Le Pen. So there is something about us that we move with the fade 
And we con my opening line was, continuities of struggle. <laughs> Knowledge is a weapon of struggle. Knowledge is a weapon of struggle. But knowledge can also produce model missionaries and model mercenaries for Western hegemony and neoliberal thought. Culture is a weapon of struggle. Amilcar Cabral says all revolution is first a cultural revolution. The first culture we must contest is around our gender roles and equality and so on and so forth. The second culture we must contest is around young and old. I keep telling people, Nkrumah must have been barely a baby, a youth, when he started the struggle. So was Blyden. And for some reason now we're telling the youth, you are the leaders of the, of the future. Why didn't you tell Nkrumah in 1919? Continuities of struggle. If we don't run the state or democratize it, if we don't run popular protest and democratize it, based on our tools, if we don't run popular economy and democratize it, if we don't own the real economy, if we are driven largely that now that these guys are going to the space and to the moon, we're not even there yet. We ourselves have become merely pawns in the game of the modern race to commodify the world and privatize it. My challenge to young people is Pan-Africanism in this century does not mean anything different from what it meant to Blyden, to Gavi. The tools of doing Pan-Africanism have changed. The moment has changed. Whereas Gavi was dealing with an America, a slave owner, you, your slave owner, does not have a whip. He has a Twitter account, a Facebook account, golden handcuffs. Like Kagoro, they tell you you're exceptional. You go and work for the leading global firms. They take you to the leading university. And as Fanon says, when you come back from there, you are a mere echo, echoing imperial dictates. Why kill? Why beat? Why ship them on the Mayflower? if they can become all of what you want them to become, plantation workers sitting in their offices or wearing suits at AU desks. The challenge of the moment for Pan-Africanism, Kenya, is that the imperative of African unity has not ended, Madam Chair. Little Kenya's economy is smaller than California as one state in the United States. Kenya cannot become a player in the world. Little South Africa's economy is meaningless, even if South Africa says we are part of BRICS. You may as well write the S with a small s. <laughs> right. So this idea that we all have this beauty contest of bullfrogs, of which economy is better, who has more roads, who has more trains, who has better, it's meaningless. That's what Nkrumah was saying. Until we are united, now we can fight here between the feminists, the so patriarchs, the so and so forth. Until we have a unity of purpose that says, Jomo Kenyatta and so and so were not united. They were not, they didn't share an ideology in 1945. There was a common minimum program of action. May Africa never be enslaved again. No matter how creative the enslavement process is. The first decolonization process is knowledge. The second decolonization process is organization. The third decolonization process is action. The fourth decolonization process is productivity. The fifth is the defense of what you have acted upon, thought about, and produced. I know I've taken long, but I hope I've been able to respond to saying the contradictions of Pan-Africanism don't mean it has failed. I told my brother Taye one day at a dinner in Johannesburg that Taye Pan-Africanism hasn't failed for states. It means dictators can support each other to rig elections pan-continentally, <laughs> right? For thieves, I told him in Nigeria, you know, the guys who stole money during military dictatorships, they stole money, they stole money. More, those guys in this modern age, they've become philanthropists, and some of them have even become <laughs> entrepreneurs. They've become all sorts of things. They've become pan-African. They stole in Nigeria, they're... they're they're, they're, they're uh, investing everywhere across the continent. So for the thieves, Pan-Africanism has worked. For state elites, Pan-Africanism has worked. 
but for the cultural industry on this continent, Pan-Africanism has worked. Before you used to dock, you used to dance to only to Ohangla and whatever Seben music here in Kenya. Today I'll hear Nigerian music here. I'll hear Kenyan music there. But here is the tragedy. The cultural industry, there's no industry in most of our countries. It is controlled and owned by the same imperialists. We only accept our runners, our singers, and our poets when New York has made them popular. So, nothing has changed, my sister, since Blyden. What has changed is how we fight the same hegemonic forces and the same marginalization. God bless.